as I'm going through the 12 rules, I think maybe one of my favorite is make friends with people who want the best for you. I am convinced that one of the reasons we've been able to grow Ramsey from nothing uh, is that I early in my process realized that isolation for leaders is a death knell. I mean, it's a real problem, especially running a small business, uh, that you just don't have anybody to talk to about this crap. Mm -hmm, right, right, you don't have anybody to process this stuff yeah, with. Yeah. And so I, I put a group of guys around me, I called them the Eagles, and they were some of the most accomplished people in our community, and I put them together in a Bible study, and we called it the Eagles Bible Study. But being around that group of men to bounce things off and to whine with when things were tough and to, you know, to process decisions and all that, I'm convinced it changed everything. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Charlie Tremendous Jones, one of the old motivators, used to say, five years from today you'll be the same you are, same as you are today, except for the books you read and the people you meet. So make friends with people who want the best for you. Uh, talk about that, especially in light of isolation issues for leaders. Yeah, well, you know, here, here's a way of thinking about, it's, it's hard to get the terms right because we talk about it, our culture, I mean, and psychologists as well, talk about it as mental health. And it sort of sounds like something that's in your head, you know, in your brain, Mental health means you have a healthy ner nervous system. Mental health means you're well-structured internally as a psychological entity. And that's actually, it's half true. So here's an example. Let's say you are mentally healthy and one of your children is doing very badly. Well, you're going to be suffering away. You're going to be anxious and distressed and have some decrement of hope. And so that's not you exactly, not if you think of you as something that's only internal, but it's definitely something that's affecting your mental health. And the reason for that is that mental health is not you. So like, you need to be well-constituted psychophysiologically, right? Your body has to be in working order, and the different elements of your nervous system have to be integrated into something like a coherent and visionary whole. And that's you. But then, like, you need an intimate partner. And that has to be a dyadic relationship that's communicating well. And then that needs to be nested inside a family. And that nest needs to be nested inside a community, including a community of friends. And then that needs to be nested inside a town or a city and, and a state or a province and then a nation. And all of those things have to be working harmoniously together. And so if you're going to be sane, you have to be acceptable to, valued by, and in constant contact with a social group. And then you need to, if you're wise, select your social group carefully. I mean, this is why there were businessmen organizations like the Rotary and the Kinsmen and so forth. And, you know, we, we see their membership plummeting in recent years. But it was there because people were wise enough to understand that even if you had attained things, you know, on your own as a solitary venture, an entrepreneur, that it was extremely useful to have a community around you. It's not good that men be alone. No, no, no. You, you, look, here's how you stay sane. This is what sane means. Sane means that you are acceptable enough to other people so they tell you when you're stupid. Right, because if you have 20 people, well, that's, that's exactly, you distribute the I problem that was of your own sanity. That's right. Well, that's what marriage, marriage, in a huge part, the advantage of marriage is that, is that, you know, your wife taps you back into position and vice versa. And all you have to do is be acceptable enough so she won't leave and she'll continue to do that. Right. Right. Well, no, every single one of us is so complicated that we can't regulate ourselves. Like, you'll fall apart on your weakest side. But if you have people around you who are bolstering you, and those would be genuine friends, those are people who are, who are pleased when good things happen to you and commiserate with you when bad things happen to you, right? They're there when you, they're there in good times and bad. And you, you know who your friends are, especially if you've gone through bad times. And it isn't that those friends in some ways are additions to your mental health. They are actually, without them, there's no way you can be mentally healthy any more than a kid with no friends can be a happy kid, right? The definition of a happy kid is one who's at the center of a well-functioning network of voluntary friends. There's no difference between that and 
setting up your life properly. That's why children set their lives up like that. You know, they're doing that to practice becoming a, a fully functional adult. And so you do, you need, you need a network around you that's thriving and communicating. And, you know, another thing to understand too is the mechanism of free speech is the process by which those social relationships maintain their integrity. So, you know, in a marriage, if, if the principle of free speech doesn't apply in your marriage, it's doomed. Because you cannot discuss your actual problems and solve them. And then they just accrue, like the little dragon that we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. They just accrue, and once there's enough of them, then you spend your fortune in divorce court. Right, so, so if, unless you can speak freely with your wife, and that means there's going to be some conflict, because free speech means conflict, because you're dealing with real problems. Unless that principle of free speech applies, the relationship will disintegrate. And that's the same at every level. That's why free speech isn't a right given to you by the state. Free speech is the precondition for the stability of the state, and it has to stay the hell away from it, from, that, from interfering with that principle, or it will doom itself, right? So that's why we think about it as a God-given right, right? It's outside. It's the process upon which the integrity of the state itself depends, no matter what level you're conceptualizing the state. You know, because the, your marriage is a tiny state. And it's the same with your family. And if the information is flowing freely, that's going to cause some conflict, obviously, because you're going to discuss difficult things. And you have to do that because life is difficult. And, you know, a problem is going to come at you, at your family, and you guys aren't going to feel the same way about how to solve it. So then you have to have a, an argument about it. You have to exchange your opinions. And hopefully you do that in a way that helps you come up with a solution to the problem that's likely to work. And so, and all that's dependent on free speech.